I'll have to remember because there was some announcement that we forgot to make that I was going to make and now I forgot. That's a sign of being a grandpa. <laughs> and we got a little feedback up here. I don't know what's feeding back. Maybe this, maybe this uh, mic up, this, yeah, there we go. Last Sabbath, woo, there we go. Last Sabbath, we started a sermon on go to church where, and we looked at the lady, oh, before we do that, I'm sorry, Rosemary is going to read our scripture for today. Yeah, it's something we've started, and I think it's a nice blessing to have different members come and read, and we read along with them, of course, it's on the screen there. And Rosemary will lead us in that. So please stand as we read the Word of God together. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Thank you, Rosemary. And what's amazing about that is everyone who was a part of that, your faith just grew. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And when you hear the Word of God and you internalize it and speak it yourself, it, it produces spiritual strength and maturity and, and energy in our lives. So praise God for the Word of God. Amen? So we started off and we looked at this experience that Jesus had with the lady at the well, at Jacob's well, there in John 4. And ends up, he's saying that God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we looked at some of that last Sabbath. And the big question is, why, why should we even worship God? Anybody got any answers out there? Raise your hand. Anybody got, why should we worship God? Because he is worthy. What else? He what? He made us. He's our creator. And he made us, he made us for his own pleasure, by the way. And it brings him joy and pleasure when we worship him and when we love him. Yeah? He is our king. Amen. He died for us. He's our savior. I heard that a few times. He first loved us, and we and and he gave. We just heard Tim sharing. He gave himself for us. That's that's some worthy reasons for worship. Amen. And he says, but God prescribes. God created us, so God is really the best one to tell us how to worship Him, right? Now He told Adam and Eve how to do that. And they chose to go a different direction. And then I'm sure that Adam and Eve trained Cain and Abel. And, and they even had an experience with God themselves. And Cain chose to go a different direction. And every time human beings have chosen to go different than the instructions of the Bible on how to worship the creator of the universe, bad things always happen. And they've continued to happen for 6,000 years. And it was that way with the children of Israel. They would go good for a while, and then maybe that king would pass away, and maybe uh, two kings later they'd be off sacrificing humans to Moloch or Baal or different gods. Hard to believe that Solomon could even be a part of that, but he married hundreds of women, and they ended up bringing their pagan religions and Satan always has a counterfeit for worship. And one of those counterfeits is human sacrifices. And it still happens today in the, in the Satan-worshipping cults, in some of them, not all of them, but in some of the Satan-worshipping cults, they actually have human sacrifices. Sometimes the, their favorite time to sacrifice humans is on October 31st. It's interesting to me that the enemy would choose that day because that day is the day when God began a great movement, a worldwide movement called the Protestant Reformation. It's known as Reformation Day. And, and so 
but, but the, the devil has succeeded in so much in taking over that day that most Christians, a lot, not most, maybe, I don't know, hopefully not most, but a lot of Christians in America won't even turn their lights on on October 31st because they don't want people knowing they're at home. And they, they think if they answer their door that they're supporting Satanism or something. To me, it's the craziest idea in the history of mankind, one of them, because God is the Lord of every day. I don't care what Satan has done. God, Jesus, is the Lord of all. He created time, and every day is time, and God owns it. And for me to sit back and let the devil run wild on any day is, is like hiding in a corner somewhere. It's just, I, I can't do that. I can't go hide when bullies are running around causing trouble. And, and, you know, I hope you find the courage and the wisdom. If you're like that, if you've been like that, or if you know someone's been like that, I hope you can find the courage to let your gospel light shine 365 days or 366 days on a leap year every year. We're not supposed to be hiding our light under a bushel. I mean, most of us learned that when we were little kids. And I think it's the greatest day, it's one of the greatest days to open your door to people. I don't care if they look like ghosts or goblins or three-eyed green monsters. I don't care what they look like. I still love them because God loves me, and that's why I love them. And I need to open that door and do something for Jesus. Amen? And if you can't do that... I'll make a recording, and you can show them a video. Open the door and let them watch me on video. <laughs> Something. We, you know, we can't be hiding and, and, and sniffling and, 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 and ah, yeah, yeah. It just drives me crazy. I remember, I, I can't, it's just, I remember in Fallbrook, California, our boys were little, and a lot of the church members wouldn't go, wouldn't do anything on Halloween. They just, oh. I can't support that day. It's the devil's day. Where do you find that in the Bible? It's God's day. God owns every day. Amen? So I'd take our, we'd get tracks. We'd get, they, said, they have special Christian Halloween tracks, and they're usually really awesome. Most, I've, I've never seen a bad Christian Halloween track. I mean, it's amazing what God can do through literature and through tracks, and so we'd buy these tracks, and we'd go to the neighborhoods, and, and they were dressed up like little farmer boys. I still remember one of they were in overalls one year, and they had their little cheeks with little pokes on it like they had freckles, you know, and they were cuter than pie, boy, I tell you what, and they'd go door to door, and they'd hand the tracks, and I tell you what, it's hard for a, it's hard, it's even hard for an atheist to say no to a cute little kid. I'm telling you, you use wisdom. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. And that's what our little boys were then, they're little babies, little boys. And they'd give these, and they, a lot of people make a big deal out of it, man. They've got big cauldrons sitting out on a fake fire, and they've got spider webs hanging all over the place, and they may even have a few witches sitting there. And I'm telling you what, it's nothing, it's, it's incredible to see our two little boys walking up and say, here is something you can read about Jesus. Boom! And the big old bomb goes off in the spiritual realm. And the demons shudder and they flee for cover because Jesus honors his word. And he honors his name. And I'm telling you, we'd go down one street and they'd hand it out. Da, 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 and we'd go down the other side of the street. We'd look back over there and they're all reading those tracks. Out on their front lawns. Reading those tracks. Amen. And if you think it's hard to go, go out on Halloween in Southern California, try it in northern Idaho or northern, northeastern Washington where it's already 20 degrees or 15 degrees on October 31st. But it's still fun there. It's still good to do that there. And so they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, a lot of people stumble over a scripture that says, Pray without ceasing. A lot of people have a hang-up with that. So how that's impossible. How can I do that? I can't be praying without ceasing. Well, then you're just a cantor. That's people who can't.
But my Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, the, and one of the huge keys is, is true understanding is a huge key in the kingdom of God. And one of the great keys of understanding how to pray without ceasing, you need to understand what the word pray means in the Bible. Most of the time, it means worship. It means adoration. It means singing unto the Lord your God. And sometimes you can sing from your heart and your lips aren't even moving, but you're still singing. You're still praying. If you've got a, if you've got a worship in your soul, if you've got a worship hymn that you're just that's going over in your heart and your mind, and you're just, you're just worshiping the God, the, the God of heaven and earth, that's praying without ceasing. And I don't know how many years it's been. It's been a lot of years, many years. Even before I got married, many, many years, God gave me this. I wake up every morning with a song running through my soul. Sometimes it's the same song for two or three days, and sometimes it's a song I haven't sung in 30 years. And that ha- I really like it when that happens, when, when these songs that I hadn't remembered for 30 years, I wake up and the Holy Spirit's got it activated and it's flowing through my soul. And then I'll walk around, getting up in the morning, I'll walk around, take care of everything, I'll go and do this and check that, and I, I got that song going, and then that song just keeps going, and then when I get down on my knees, I start singing, some, I start singing that song. Usually I'll sing that song. And you can have this blessing if you, if you, if you, if you say, yes, I want to be one who worships you in spirit and in truth, 24-7, praying without ceasing. Worship, the word pray is most often applied to worship, adoring, singing, and, and just meditating on the word of God. That's part of Worship, that's part of praying. So that is the the huge thing, seven days a week, folks. Seven days a week, praying without ceasing. That's a big deal. And we talk, we're talking about go to church where? Well, I, you know, we talked about wherever you're at. That's where church is. Wherever people are gathered in Jesus' name, wherever someone is in Jesus' name, that's church. So church is not really a where, it, I mean, it, not a building, it's not a building where, it's, it's a wherever you are, that's where you're in church, 24-7. And when you start talking to somebody else about Jesus, they just joined you in church, they're now in church. And we need to be able to converse with them in a way that makes them feel like they're in church. They realize there's something different going on here. I've had people talk to me about Jesus before, but I've never experienced this, this, this uh, atmosphere. Something's, something's powerful here. Something's real. And I know some of you have experienced that. Most of us have. And that's what I pray for. I pray for God's presence to go before me, to prepare the people who I'm going to meet. I pray for His presence to be around me, to protect me from whatever. And behind me, I pray for God's presence and say, Lord, after I talk with them, they, they're going to forget my name. They're going to forget my face. They may even forget the things I said, but they will never forget how they felt in your presence. The two men on the road to Emmaus, remember, they didn't even recognize Jesus. But they said, our, didn't our hearts burn within us? Because God was there with them. That's what, that's what I pray for every day. Lord, just, you know, let that be people's memories of me. You know, let that be, let, may they think about Jesus when they remember me. And, and that's a big miracle, folks. That's a huge miracle. That the Holy Spirit's the only one who can pull that off. I can't get good enough. I can't dress myself up. I can't act. I can't do all that. I can't do anything to make people uh, remember God and Jesus, but He can. He can do it. And that's what we need more than anything. People don't need me to get to heaven. They need Jesus. And, And they need Jesus' help down here. And it's beautiful to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we're going to look Old Testament, New Testament, 
And I'm just going to share a few things as we do. Whoops, there we go. God told the early church, the Israelites, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth for the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it for holy use. That's what it means to hallow something. You dedicated for a holy purpose. God created time. He's the only one that can make time holy. Nobody else can declare any time holy except God. And he declares the seventh day to be for holy purposes. And we shouldn't bring the common onto the, the holy places. Now, I find some real interesting, and I put it in the King James because it's just like, you know, everybody knows that God speaks in King James, right? Well, there's people who actually believe that, but I don't. But anyway, it, 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 it's very poetic. But when God spoke this from the mountain, it was very powerful. And they heard it. I, I assume they heard it in Hebrew. But they'd all been speaking Egyptian for a long time. So we'll have to wait and see. And they may argue about it down here. But when we get to heaven, there'll be no more arguing about the language of heaven. I, I, it blew my mind when I first started attending Spanish churches with my wife, Esper. She wasn't my wife at the time. but we, and, I, and, and these guys really were serious about this. The language of heaven is, is, is Spanish. It's going to be Spanish. And man, they are serious. They, they will almost fight you for that. And, and I just said, fine with me. Habla Espanol. You know. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, What's interesting to me is this right here. Whatever you're in charge of, wherever your house is or wherever your, your sphere is, these guys, which are foreigners or people that don't even believe, these folks that may be your hired help, are not supposed to be doing anything in a servant status. And that's huge. It's wherever your feet go. Wherever your feet go, you're in charge. And that, that should sink down on us a little bit. Uh, you're in charge either for God or for Satan. Because wherever you go, you're going to spill out whatever's in you. It's going to come out. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what's interesting is that you are a slave to whoever you give your mind and your soul to. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it works. Now, when people first started uh, challenging me about the Seventh-day Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, I just, just wrote them off and Figured they were all just a little bit goofy and a little bit confused and a little bit mixed up. And I don't need to waste any more of my time with those folks. You know, don't bother me. And, and then they did all they could do. I mean, God sent people. He sends people to us. And I just kind of brushed them off. And then God started hammering on me. And, and you know what? Here's, what? here's my conviction. I don't believe, well... I know I would have never started keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath if God hadn't hammered on me. Because people's hammers just don't do much for me when it comes to eternity. People's arguments or their presentations or, or their little nice little Bible studies that they put together on any subject. I listen to it and then I'll say, okay God, that's what they told me, but what do you say about this? And until he tells me, I don't embrace it. I don't follow it. I don't care what it is. I had to do that because I was in a world full of a lot of craziness when I woke up and found out that there wa even was a, a God and that the Bible really is God's Word. And then there's about 3,000 different interpretations of about 3,000 different things in the Bible. And so I said, man, this is serious business, and I sure don't want to go around teaching people wrong. 
Because I found a verse in James. It says that it's, it's, uh, it's better not to be a teacher than to be a teacher and teach people error and cause them to stumble. And he says it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown in the ocean. And I don't even like swimming in the ocean, let alone landing on the bottom of the ocean. Now, I used to like swimming in the ocean. I used to love it. And then I saw Jaws. And even after that, it took a few years. It took a few years, but I, I even went back out again. I'd go way past the breakers, and I'd go swimming, and I would have fun, and blah, 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 blah. And then I, and then I realized I started watching the evening news, and people were getting bit by big sharks. So I no longer go, to the, I no longer go past there. I may not even go there because I don't like being shark supper. And if that's a chicken, bok, bok, bok. <laughs> anyway, it's an amazing experience to discover. Now, Ezekiel 20 is a cool chapter. And I like this because it helps me to explain to people why I keep the Sabbath. Because a lot of people want to know, why are you doing that? And, and so look at this with me, please. Moreover, I, God is speaking here. I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. I'm the Lord who makes them holy. I'm the one in charge of cleansing you from sin and healing you and saving you from the curse of sin. I'm in charge. It's all me. You don't have to do anything. Now, that's amazing that the Sabbath is a sign that I don't have to do anything to be saved. That God's doing it all. I, uh, that's New Testament grace. That's New Testament gospel. That you can't save yourself. Self, I will do it for you. Don't even worry about your sins. You realize it's a sin to worry about your sins? So you're just piling sin on top of sin. Surrender, give your life, give your sins to Jesus and say it's all yours. And whatever you want in my life, let's go do it. Just give me a little time to figure out and make sure it's you when I'm doing it. And I like that. It's a signal that, that the creator of the universe is the one in charge of saving me from sin. Wow. I like that. I really like that. That's right in the Old Testament. You know, they had the... They actually had the gospel of grace in the Old Testament. They just didn't have the cross. And the cross is like this giant magnifying glass with a huge spotlight behind it, just illuminating everything in Isaiah, everything in Daniel, everything in Genesis. It illuminates everything, and then it comes flooding out into the New Testament, and there it is, boom, bigger than, bigger than the moon. And that's where it is. We've always had the gospel. Because it's called the everlasting, it's the eternal gospel. The book of Revelation, Jesus calls it the eternal gospel. That means the gospel has no beginning. The gospel has no end. I really like that because I wasn't at the beginning, but I sure plan to be at, well, there's no end. But I plan to be there wherever that is. And I, and I know I will still need the gospel. Amen? So I like that. And then he says, hallow, in other words, in other words, make my Sabbath sacred, make them, use them for holy purposes, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. That's, I like that, because if somebody says, why do you keep the seventh day of Sabbath? Because Jesus is the Lord God of heaven and earth. That's, that's it, because of Jesus. And I like that, uh, and it's, it's really cool. 2020, for 2020 vision on the Sabbath, you need to go to Bible text on the Sabbath. Now, now, here's a big one, because the day that I first saw this, I had read it before, but I'd never seen it. You know, you read things in the Bible, but you don't see it, right? I mean, I do. There's stuff I'm seeing now. After reading the Bible for 43 years, I'm still seeing stuff that I've never seen, but I've read it, but I've never seen it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And it's incredible. I, it's amazing. And so... An Adventist pastor, Seventh-day Adventist pastor, knocked on my door, and he said, Hi, my name's Ernest Johnson. I'm the pastor of the local Seventh-day Adventist church here in town, and uh, I've been hearing about your preaching, 
and I'd, I'd like to visit with you. I think we have something in common we could talk about. I looked him square in the eyeballs, and I said, you and I have nothing to talk about because you're not even a Christian, and I don't have fellowship with darkness. And that is straight out of the book of Ephesians, in case you're wondering. I was quoting him scripture. And, and uh, because I, he didn't know this, but I was handing out pamphlets explaining why Seventh-day Adventists were not Christians. Because they, they, I, the pamphlet was from an ex-Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and I figured if anybody knew what Adventists believe, it had to be this pastor. He'd pastored for 20 years, and now he was exposing all their legalism and how they're saved by works and all this craziness that they're teaching and all that. And so I was handing that literature out. He didn't know that. And he was a humble, sweet Christian. And after I said that, he kind of, he didn't even, it, it didn't even bother. It didn't even, he didn't even flinch. This guy was a seasoned warrior for Jesus. And I didn't know it. And he said, well, I, I wonder if you could have a few moments, a few minutes to, to share with me why it is that we're not Christians. That's what he said. And, I, and, and the Holy Spirit, I heard him, he's right behind me, like that still small voice that Isaiah speaks about in Isaiah 30. He says, invite him in, maybe you can save this one. <laughs> and I thought, maybe, well, whatever you say. I said, well, come on in, I'll show you. I took him through my document explaining why Adventists aren't Christians and all the kooky things they believe. And he took that thing apart. In an amazing way. And he took it apart with the Bible. Everything in there, he turned, and he showed me things in the Bible I'd never seen. And I've been preaching for three years when this happened in the Sunday churches. And he showed me things in the Bible. And I thought, wow, I didn't know that was in there. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. And then he had all these historical documents that he was showing, all these historical things. And this is one of the big ones. This one almost knocked me out of my chair when he showed me this. This one right here. He says, uh, taken from Daniel chapter 7, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints. So this is some enemy against God. When you're making war against saints, you're an enemy of God. And it's actually talking about the Antichrist. And prevailing against them, actually winning and defeating them. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. And then he showed me how that the church of Rome had come up among ten nations in the old Roman Empire. And then when the Roman Empire fell apart, it fell apart into ten different nations. And then when the, Ro when the church of Rome came up, it destroyed three of those nations. He showed it all to me in the history books. This guy had a briefcase full of this stuff. And he showed me all that. And that's after he took apart my document, by the way. And then he, go, and then he goes in on this. He's, and he asked me, he says, w would it be okay if I showed you a few things? And I thought, sure, why not? I had no idea what this guy was getting ready to drop on me, man. And so he dropped that on me. And I thought, wow, that's heavy. And then he goes on. He shall speak pompous, arrogant words against the Most High, Jesus Christ. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and he shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And I'm thinking, wow, that's heavy. And that's all code to me. And then he showed me that the only commandment in the Bible of the Ten Commandments that tells anything about time is the Fourth Commandment, Sabbath Commandment, and that the enemy of God, this little horn power trying to destroy the church, is the one that's going to change the law that deals with time. And I was really pretty, uh, pretty shook by now. And then he explained this time, times, and half a time, which we won't go into right now, but that's, the, Bible actually, the Bible, Bible actually defines that. It interprets that. Now, now, to take you back a little bit, a year previous to this date, now this was in June 1978. A year previous to that, you know, it was about a year and four months, I was in February in sub-freezing weather for about 60 days. It never got above freezing for about 60 days. It was a terrible winter. And the water pipes had all frozen up in the house where I was staying. I was staying in, in the house, and it was called the Holy Ghost House. 
And this house was uh, rented and operated by a dear, dear grandma, dear grandma, Alameda Perkins. And it was in the, well, back then we called it the black side of town. Some people called it the colored side of town. Now I don't know what you would call it because people are changing a lot of things. So I guess you could call it that side of town. I don't know. But I lived over there in that house because those people didn't have money to pay for their gas bill. And she was raising two little grandchildren. And the, the, the parents had both flipped out on drugs and gone wild. And who knows, they were probably in California or somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was a door-to-door -door insurance salesman. I tell you what, God knows how to train a person. I'd been a Christian by then. I'd been a Christian for a little over a year. And I tell you what, when you give your life to Jesus, he'll put you through boot camp. And going door-to-door -door selling life insurance on, in, in the black side of town a white boy selling life insurance in the, white, in the black side of town. That's boot camp in the south. I was in the northern part of the south, and it gets cold in the northern part of the south. And Muskogee, Oklahoma, and don't you ever believe that they don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. They do. For those of you who know that song, that song is a lie. Anyway, I was door to door. I knocked on the door. And there she was, all bundled up like she was getting ready to go snow skiing. And I thought, man, she must be pretty tight, pinching pennies, keeping the heater off and just dressing like that. Well, the heater was off because she hadn't been able to pay the bill. They had turned the gas off on her and her little grandchildren. And I just couldn't handle that. I said, i got to move in. And I prayed, and the Lord said, you got to move in there. And you got to help pay for their gas and get that gas turned back on. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Amen. Man, it was one of the greatest times of my life. You talk about some prayer meetings. <laughs> when you move into a place called the Holy Ghost House, being run by evangelist Alameda Perkins, Ordained in the church of Jesus Christ, deliverance, you better know you're going to have some prayer meetings in there. Wow, we had some times in there. So the, the water pipes were frozen. But those of you who've ever lived in those conditions know that the hot water pipes freeze first. Because there's, there's air, hot water has more air in it, and lets the cold get in between the water molecules, and it freezes the hot water first. If you ever want to freeze water, put the hot water out on the front porch to freeze it. It'll freeze first. So the hot water pipes are frozen. Cold water pipes were barely dripping. That's what you do. You, you, you leave them on, and then they drip, 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 and then finally, hopefully, it gets warm enough, and they start dripping a little more, and pretty soon you at least have running cold water. Well, we had gotten to the place where we had running cold water. I had worked on my car that morning. It was a Saturday morning. And these Seventh-day Pentecostals were after me to go to church with them on Sabbath. Now, she was not a Sabbath keeper, but a lot of her friends were Sabbath keepers. It's a Seventh-day Pentecostal church. I don't remember the name of it, what it was. I think it had something to do with deliverance there, too. And... and uh, Anyway, they were young men, and they wanted me to go to church with them. And I had gone to church with them one time, and that was more than this little white boy Lutheran could handle. I mean, they were really expressive, and they were a little, little bit out there for me. And I said, well, uh, yeah, okay, I don't think so. And then they start, that was a Wednesday night. And they get a lot more lively on Wednesday night than they do on Saturday morning. I'm just telling you, if you've never been there, they do. And, and they get a little more, they feel a little more free. And they, they play the drums a little louder and the guitars a little louder. And I'd never seen a guitar in a church. And I'd never seen drums in a church. And that was a little shocking to me. And, uh, you know, hope you can be empathetic towards me. Why I kept, no, I, no, I can't go. And then they said, well, you need to come and you need to worship on the Sabbath. And I go, no, nah, I don't need that Sabbath thing. I don't, I don't need that. I'm, I'm, I'm free from all that. And I was working on my car. And it was cold. You ever worked on your car when it's below freezing? That's cold. But you got to have a car if you're going to sell life insurance. 
or buy some real warm shoes, you know. And so I was out there, and I got my hands all greasy. And there was grease up on my elbows, you know, because you're reaching up and stuff. And it was early. That was early. And they came by. Well, we're having a service this afternoon. You can come Sabbath afternoon. I said, no, man, I'm too greasy. I'm not going to church like this all greasy, and I don't have any hot water to wash with. There's no way I can come. That was my excuse. Oh, well, we'll, you know, the cold water's working, and we'll, we'll put pots of cold water on the stove, and we'll heat that cold water up, and we'll carry it upstairs to the bathroom for you, and you can take a hot bath before it's time to go to church this afternoon. And I thought, no, I can't do that. You're not going to let you guys carry my bath water for me. I'm a man. I don't let other people carry my own my bath water. And besides that, it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be working like that on the Sabbath. That's what I told them. So you learn all these little tricks to try to. And so, uh, and they finally convinced me, no, it's okay, it's a good cause. So you can go to church and, okay, whatever, go ahead. The whole stove was full of pots, little pots, big pots, all the pots they could find, and they were heating them up. It's going to take a lot of hot water for this white boy's big body to get in that bathtub. So uh, they went off. I was all alone in the kitchen. And they went off the other side of the house, some bedroom. And I know what they were doing. They were praying for this country boy to get his eyes open. And I just kind of chuckled to myself, and I said, okay, ah, okay, Lord, I said, here's the deal. Those guys are going to carry that boiling water, that hot water up to, so I can take a bath because they want me to go to church. And if this is really you, if this Sabbath thing is really something you care about and something that's important to you, God, Father, then, then I'm going to, I'm just asking you to thaw out that hot water pipe right now in the name of Jesus. And when I said the word amen, you could hear those hot water pipes cranking and clanging and snapping and popping. And within three seconds, the hot water was going full speed out of those hot water pipes. Because you leave the water, you leave the faucet open. Now let me tell you something, that is impossible. When the pipes are frozen solid, it don't happen in three seconds. It may take three days for that much water to be coming out. Full faucet, full pipe, full loud. And I knew then I was in trouble. I said, okay, God, I'll, this is what I'll do. I'll keep both days holy until you prove to me from the Bible that this is really you. I know what you just did, or I know what I think you just did, but Satan can sometimes come in like an angel of light and make it look like you did it when it was really him. So I'm just going to be sure I'm going to keep both days holy for a, until you show me. That had happened a year and a half earlier, a year and four months. And here's this Seventh-day Adventist pastor Blowing my mind with this. That some creep who kills saints is going to come along and change the law that has to do with time. And I'm going, wow, this is over the, over the top. And I looked at him and I said, how long have you guys known about this? Oh, he says, oh, a little over 100 years. A hundred years? He goes, well, yeah, yeah, why, why? I said, well, why aren't you telling anybody? And he goes, well, we're trying. I just told you. And I go, well, yeah. <laughs> it was incredible. This kind of stuff can shake your life. And, and I knew that, and here's the big, here's another part of it. God knows how to put you through the ringer. It's too bad I didn't have this visit uh, a month earlier because I had already enlisted in the Navy delayed entry this was on July the 14th and I had to report to the military on August the 1st and now I was going to have to go tell them that I don't do anything on Sabbath that has some, unless it has something to do with worship or ministry that doesn't go over real good in boot camp, folks. No. And that's a whole nother. I don't have time to tell you all that. We've got to finish this. But that was a big setup. In Daniel's day, the issue is worship. Clear as day. Whoop, whoop. 
In John's day, the issue is worship. It's been worship ever since Satan rebelled in heaven. He said, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will be worshipped. It's all about following Satan. That's his issue. He wants people to follow him and not God. So, you know what I think? I think there's too many cell phones on in here, and that's why this thing's not working between here and there. Too many cell phones send signals all over the place, and I think that may be why. So we may have to outlaw cell phones. And then, then we'll have a lot more room for new people to come to church. Because a lot of you may, may not be able to let go of your cell phone. Hey, you're not the only one that has trouble with cell phones, whoever you are. God dealt with me about my cell phone this morning. He's been dealing with me for months, uh, every day, not just Sabbath, but every day. But I woke up this morning, I said, man, i got to find out what that crazy Irma is doing today. Those of you who don't know who Irma is, her, 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 uh, her boyfriend, her fiancé, is Jose. Jose is a big earthquake, uh, earthquake, a big hurricane chasing Irma. This is serious business. And we do need to be lifting those precious people up over there. And we need to be lifting up the Christians over there that they might rise and shine and be able to help people with the power of Jesus, with the wisdom and the skill and the blessing of Jesus. Amen? We need to be praying for Christians to represent Christ so that the unbelievers in those areas may come and, and, and not blame God for this, but come and ask God for help. That's what I'm praying. So, in John's day is worship. Whoa, this thing's really going wacky on me. So they worship the dragon, that's the devil, who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Do you know that's in the Old Testament? Who is like our God? Who is able to make war with our God? That's what the Israelites used to say. It's actually in the Old Testament. Now the devil, the devil has hijacked the word of God for a small time of trouble. It's called the time of trouble. It's a short time. Praise God for that. All who dwell on the earth will worship the dragon whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, the Lamb's book of life, who was slain from the foundations of the world. From, from before, from when God created, they already agreed what they were going to do. They already agreed that the Lamb would, that Jesus would die for sinners. This thing did not surprise God, and it did not surprise Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible teaches. I'm going with the Bible. He was slain from the foundations of the world. He was the creator of the world. The creator of the world knew that we were going to sin. But he wanted love. And he wanted people to love him out of free choice. And he knew that free choice would give them the option to hate him. And to despise him. And to spit on him. And to nail him to a cross. And to kill him. He knew that when he gave us free will. And he knew that he was going to lie down on that cross before he ever created us. He didn't go in and make any deals with the Father when Adam sinned. The deal had already been made. Lock that away. It will be very, very valuable in the days ahead. It's about worship. And the devil was granted power to give breath to this worldwide, one world government, one world religious system that is already being erected on the earth, but it's been delayed for a short time. And I don't know how much time we got left, but it was steamrolling a few months ago. But things have gotten in their way, and they are upset. But they're not going to give up. And this October 31st in Sweden is going to be a major day in the history of the human race. And if you don't know about it, just look it up on the internet. 
I don't have time to tell you. We're almost out of time. And he gave power to this beast. The devil gives his power to this one world, one world religion, one world government, economic system, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the dragon who's in the beast and the beast who carries the dragon. He will cause them to be killed if they don't worship him. Now the good news on that is they don't get to start killing Christians wholesale or mass killing of Christians during the time of trouble until the time of trouble is about two-thirds or three-fourths of the way done. And you'll find that in Revelation 9. It's amazing. God's laid it all out so that as we see it happen, uh, we've already heard the word of God. And when we, when we see prophecy being fulfilled, our faith will mount up with wings like eagles. God knows we're going to have to have super faith. And that's why he's given us these prophecies so that our faith can just soar. Pro apocalyptic prophecy has this element in it. It causes our faith to just soar. And they say with a loud voice, and here's what God says about this whole thing, fear God and give glory to Him, honor Him, God the Father, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And the reason I will show you God the Father in a minute. In the beginning, all three of them were there in Genesis 1, all three. Jesus was the creating agent, but they were all three there. And in the book of Revelation, they're all three there. They're always there. And it's exciting to see this. This language is, comes right out of the fourth commandment. This language is in the fourth commandment that we just read a while ago. The same language about the creator of the universe. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships this beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You've got a choice. You drink the wine of Babylon, you will also drink the wine of the wrath of God. You drink the new wine of the Holy Spirit, you will drink of living water, Jesus Christ, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. A lot of Christians don't like it. I'm not changing it. That's what it says. If some monster, predator, wild, crazed maniac came in here right now and began assaulting and raping my wife, I would tear that person limb from limb and I would go after this person with a vengeance. And that's what God's going to do when Satan raises up his sick, disgusting army and they come after the bride of Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. They will not spit in his face this time. No, 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 no. A sharp two-edged sword comes out of his mouth and he kills them all in a moment. They fall dead all over the earth and the fowls of the earth will devour their flesh. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. Don't you change it or you'll be in big trouble. There's a lot of Adventists monkeying with this stuff and changing things and they better stop. Well, I'll just swing this around and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, this is powerful. That Adventist pastor showed me this that day too. I almost swallowed my teeth and I don't even have false teeth. But anyway, here is the patience of the saints. Here's the endurance. Here's what gives saints their power. Here are those who cherish. That word keep means cherish and value. You look it up. The commandments of Father God and the faith of Jesus God. In fact, you got to have this first. Before you ever value or respect the Ten Commandments, you've got to have Jesus. And that's New Testament. That's end of time. Together. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the... I like this. Right after this, 
These are the guys that Satan's attacking. And right after this, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. From now on, after that time of trouble, when he's allowed to start killing Christians, they'll be, you're blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, there's the Spirit, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works will follow them. Your prayers will follow you. Everyone you've ever shared and talked to about Jesus, they will never forget what you've told them. They may forget you. They may forget your face. They may forget your, your name. But they won't forget what you shared with them about Jesus because the Holy Spirit is there to make sure they never forget. Anybody knows that's not a Roman numeral for four, right? Wrong. They changed it after the 1300s to an I and a V. This is what it was in ancient times. I think that's really interesting that they changed it. And the same people who changed the day of worship Change the Roman numeral to I and a V. That is really wild, in case you're wondering. I found that late last night. And I thought, these clowns don't even know what a Roman numeral. So I looked it up. And guess what? That's the way it was in the ancient times. Isn't that heavy? It changed in the 1300s. And that's when people were doing other monkey, monkey things, too. Well, here's what Jesus says. We're closing. I know we're a little over, but I hope that this is worth it. I was waiting for one amen. I, oh, praise God. Whew, I almost ran and hid on that one. <laughs> Do not think. Jesus said, don't even think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, if I go, and if I go in a 60-mile uh, speed zone, and I drive 60 miles an hour, does that give you the liberty to go 100 miles an hour in there since I fulfilled it? Since I kept it, does that mean you can just go break it? I don't think you better try. God's law is eternal. And here's what Jesus says about that. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. That's it. All. Until heaven and earth pass away. Did heaven and earth pass away on the day that Jesus died? No. But that's what people are teaching. They're teaching that all that passed away when Jesus died. Heaven and earth didn't pass away when Jesus died, but the law did. So Jesus just didn't know what he was talking about. Let's just, let's just go tell everybody that Jesus was some kind of a mixed up kook. I don't think so. And it even gets better or worse, whichever way you want to look at it. Wait a minute. I'm doing this thing. Okay. He continues. And make no mistake, he's talking about the Ten Commandments here. He just talked about them before this. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I like it because I used to say, oh, that Sabbath commandment's not important. It's, it's the least of them. I didn't even realize what I was doing. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And I used to think, well, I don't need to keep the Sabbath. At least I'll be in heaven. I'll be least in the kingdom of heaven. But I don't mind being a janitor in heaven. I, that's good. I don't mind being a street sweeper in heaven. It's golden streets. So that's not a bad deal. I don't mind being least in heaven. And then I found out that's not what least in heaven is. The kingdom of heaven is when God is standing there and there's sheep here and there's goats here and he separates one to fire and the other one to paradise. And that's, when the, that's what he's talking about. The kingdom of heaven has come to earth. Now, if you want to be zero, exactly nothing, then teach people to break the commandments. And I've thought about this some. That's a repeat. Jesus didn't come. He's not the one that Daniel said was going to change the law. It's his enemy. The one who hates Christians. The one who's, who, who killed 
and, and people didn't do this. Our battle is not against human beings. It's not against some church from Rome. It's against demons of hell. It's against spiritual wickedness and rulers and principalities of darkness. They killed over 50 million Christians in the 1260-year period of the Dark Ages. That's serious. And the one thing that we are learning from history, history as a human race is that we never learn from history. That's what we're learning. We are repeating the same mistakes as the generation 80 years ago. We're repeating the same mistakes right here in the United States. We're repeating the same mistakes that occurred in Nazi Germany. We're repeating them right now. And if you haven't been keeping up with it, you are in, you better get some catch-up going. You better start catching up. Catch-up. Not ketchup and mustard. I'm talking about catch up with the, what's going on down here. The United States is experiencing the same kind of things that communist Russia did in the 1917 period and that Nazi Germany experienced in 1934. We're experiencing the same things in our society, in our government, in our world. It's happening here. My grandpa who grew up in communist Russia, had to flee for his life before he died. He saw it. He died in the late 60s. He saw it already happening back there. But we didn't see it. We're too busy partying. We're too busy enjoying the American dream. We couldn't see it. My great uncle, who escaped through Siberia from the communists, he lived in Milwaukee. I met him there in 1978. And he told me the same thing. My grandpa was already dead. And I, and I talked to this great uncle of mine. He said the same thing. America is disappearing. And it won't take them much longer. And the only reason it's taking them much longer is because God the Holy Spirit's been holding them back. But things are slipping pretty fast these days. Now here's, how, here's my conviction. If God doesn't bother you about lying, you just keep right on lying. If you think you can get away with it. If God hadn't have dealt with me about my lying, I'd still be lying, I guarantee you. I'm not going to stop lying just for some person, some human being, but I will stop lying for my creator. I hate to admit that people don't, didn't used to matter to me that much, but they do now. I didn't stop stealing from my mother. I stole a lot of money from my mom. And when I finally got converted and tried to share with her that I'd done that, she didn't believe that I ever did. But I stole a lot of money out of her drawer. And I wouldn't stop, and I would have never stopped if Jesus hadn't come into my life. I'm sorry to have to admit that I'm that wretched, that I'm that uh, big of a jerk. A jerk steals from their mother, and that's who I was. What was I stealing for? For booze and for partying. That's even a bigger jerk. But praise God for Jesus. And I guarantee you, amen, 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 amen. And I guarantee you, if he hadn't have dealt with me and if he hadn't have done those signs and wonders on those frozen pipes, and if he hadn't have sent that seventh day of his pastor to my door, I'd still be having the time of my life in the Sunday Christian churches, and I'd still be on my way to heaven because until God deals with you about something, until he confronts with you about it, until he says, I need to help you, you need to surrender that to me, don't worry about it. And don't worry other people about it. If there's people in your house that don't think the Seventh Day Adventist, the Seventh Day Sabbath has anything to do with loving God, don't harass them. Don't and don't let it worry you. We're supposed to be peacemakers, not troublemakers. Amen. So unless God, until and unless God puts you in a situation where he, where he, like he did Balaam on the donkey, he made Balaam look, 
And that's how we need to be. God, I'm not following any bunch of kooks, but if you want me to do it, I'll do it. And if you think Adventists don't look like kooks, you need to go live on the other side for a while and you'll figure out how kooky we look. And that's a whole other sermon. We're, out, we're way out of time. So we're going to close and Tim's going to sing again. And I love this song because it talks about Jesus and his beautiful love for us.